My name is Tristan McCallum and I'm an Additive Manufacturing Applications Engineer. So my job is to find industrial processes that would benefit from printing either products or components. Today, I'm going to talk to you about something I care way too much about and that's additive manufacture of continuous flow reactors. Continuous flow reactors being devices that separate or combine reagents for a chemical reaction and that's done continuously. So they're just, they're, they're different from VAT processes or batch processes. Um, these are of particular interest to chemical and pharmaceutical production, but a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today on the AM side, the, the design freedoms, the quick turnaround in research and development, the low cost of small runs, is much more widely applicable. So if you're in another industry, I'd invite you to listen in anyway. If you see something that relates to you, please don't hesitate to get in touch. I joined IMR, that's Irish Manufacturing Research, about a year and a half ago, working with the additive manufacturing team. Um, so I work with Irish companies to find competitive advantage by incorporating additive manufacturing where it's suitable for their business. This might be in product development, it might be in manufacture of final product, or it might be manufacture of process components that support their production. Prior to that, I was working with Dupuy Synth and Cork on AM of orthopaedic implant. Before I moved to Ireland, I had 14 years of experience in New Zealand with advanced manufacturing technologies, of which additive was a major player. Why, why is additive manufacturing of continuous flow reactors important now? Well, competition from abroad is a major challenge to manufacturing. Products that used to be considered speciality chemicals are now commoditized. They're made cheaply and easily, easily elsewhere, particularly in Asia and the Middle East, and that causes several problems for local industry. There might have been significant investment in plant. If there's a 10 year payback and customers move away after seven years, you're left with a legacy plant that somehow has to finish paying itself off. Big plant is not flexible. Setting up new plant requires some careful analysis of future risk and there's always a time lag between identifying a product opportunity and, and your first batch. If your customer demands change, it's difficult to scale large plant up and down to meet customer requirements. Both of these problems cause a third problem, a squeeze on research and development. Clearly, new products are required if manufacture of existing ones has gone elsewhere, but there's a pressure to be conservative. Research and development is speculative, and there might be a big win in the lab, but there might be some sig very significant barriers to moving a lab top process to the factory floor. So, what's needed is a way to provide flexible, scalable plant that's cheap, quick to commission, and allows a company to provide a genuinely new product offer. In recent years, there's been considerable interest in microfluidics and other small-scale continuous flow devices as they directly address the problems we just discussed. Additive manufacture is showing good potential for economic production of these devices and um, offers interesting design freedoms to simplify and improve process control and to increase production rate over existing microfluidic solutions. Here's a notional device I worked up to illustrate the principle. It's a mixer and it combines two reagents, allowing them to come into intimate contact with each other in a small scale channel. The product's delivered at the outlet. So the key bit is small scale channels allow intimate contact between the reagents. The surface area to volume ratio of the reagents is much higher and that allows reactions to be completed more quickly and to a higher level and to be more accurately controlled than in VAT processes. We, we can print these directly from digital files, so that means we can relate the physical geometry of our CAD back to the fundamental principles driving the reaction, the fluid dynamics and the thermal and mass transfer properties of the reagents. And this allows us to optimise the device to deliver the maximum amount of product at the required degree of the reaction. We can even integrate, our process, control uh, integrate process control elements, smart valves on feedback loops, to sensors so you can cut or transfer flow if a compromised product quality is detected. Because of the scale these guys ran at, they're quick and easy to print. The notional device I'm showing here, I can get a bed of them turned around in under 90 hours. And the bed has 65 parts on it and that's at a part cost of under 40 euro. That's in full production. If I was trialling this as part of an R&D project, it takes about 5 hours to print 2 or 3 and with a total print cost of 400 euro. That means you can test, alter, print and retest in a 24 hour period and that is of serious value if you're developing a product. So these devices have a small output. How does that stack up against other processes? It's simple, you use lots of them. 
and you run them all of the time and that's not as crazy as it sounds if you've already validated the system in the lab it's a straightforward it's a straightforward shift to the factory floor or more straightforward anyway because you can leverage your existing validation protocols scale up happens in parallel so much of the circuit is is the same in small scale and so manually very easy to set up in short you've made your production much more flexible and drastically reduced the barrier between R and D in production. They can be used in series as well. By setting up different reactors in combination, multi-step reactors can be designed quickly and transferred to the factory floor. Once you have these files, you have a digital library. You can put any combination of them on a build plate when required, and these files are your intellectual property. So they, are, they remain a black box to your competitors and they offer you a significant competitive advantage. Microfluidics and other continuous flow devices have been around a while, so why get excited about them now? Because they're now accessible, so previously manufacturing these units required significant upfront investment in design, machining and tooling, and the available geometries were limited. There is a huge amount of freedom available with additive manufacturing. The small scale these channels run to are a great fit for repeatable production by AM. And an interesting side note, the CAD can be tested using CFD software, so you can have a CFD analysis and iteration prior to exporting the same file you run your analysis on directly for print. The device, the second notional device on the screen, is designed to combine a liquid and a gaseous phase. So I've taken a gyroid, perforated it with a lattice and achieved a complex mixing geometry. I can control this, I can control the reaction quality by controlling the length of this geometry or by including this interstitial volumes to allow thermal fluid to control the device temperature along the length. If I need to adjust my CAD, I can do this in the field equations driving my gyroid. That's not difficult. Actually changing the CAD doesn't take long. Getting the testing done, doing the theoretical work, that's the difficult bit, but because we've, predict, we've compressed our research and development cycle and we can produce prototypes quickly, we're greatly supporting the team who are doing the R&D. I'm not free to speak directly about application to specific chemical manufacturing processes, but to give you a practical example today, I can talk about carbon sequestration. So here we're looking at an absorption-desorption cycle. This plant would fit to a steam turbine and it would extract carbon dioxide from the flue gas. So what's happening here is carbon dioxide heavy flue gas is running to an absorption column, that's the blue box on the left, and the CO2 is being scrubbed out with the solvent. So far so good. This is, well it's, it's not cheap to set up but it's relatively cheap to run. The trick is getting the carbon dioxide back out of the solvent. That happens on the desorption side over on the right. And here I've taken a few liberties. There are several large and expensive plant items, the condenser, the reboiler, and the desorption column, neatly represented as a green box. And this is where things get expensive and start to cost a lot of money. To give you an idea of how much money, if this is fitted to a coal-burning steam plant, and they are fitted to a coal-burning steam plant, there is a cost impact of 30%. There is a huge energy penalty to be paid in getting the solvent hot enough to release the CO2 for regeneration and reuse. And that's because You've got to evaporate a large amount of your solvent for desorption. It just takes a lot of energy, which you could be using to generate electricity, which you then sell. So what we need here is a solution that either uses less energy or that uses lower value energy. And by lower value energy, I mean heat energy from a lower temperature source. What would be ideal is if it could run off a heat source that ran at about 90 degrees. There's loads of that in any plant. Um, it is often used, but this would be a very valuable use of that energy. This plant can't use lower grade heat. The desorption side of the process simply isn't efficient enough. So here's a solution that can run at lower grade heat. We can make use of the vastly improved performance of microscale continuous flow. Here we've set up a lot of reactors in, in parallel to run lower amounts of solvent and to get the desorption side running at a lower temperature. This greatly improves the cost performance of the plant. So the thermal efficiency of these two designs is around the same, it's 4-6%. to But the cost performance of the second system is greatly improved because the intimate mixing and greater reaction efficiency of these devices allow much more complete desorption and that can take place without needing to boil off the solvent. So in conclusion, small scale continuous flow reactors have been of interest for a while but until recently there's been no easy way to compress the design and manufacture cycle for R&D. The advantages they offer deserve consideration. 
They allow flexible production due to low capital cost. They allow compressed implementation time since validation during R&D can be directly leveraged for production. And when produced by additive manufacture, there are much greater design freedoms available to develop process specific geometries. Using a rules based approach to design allows you to relate product geometry and performance parameters to achieve high levels of control over sensitive or difficult reactions. Finally, and very importantly, they allow a company to develop its own IP rather than selecting off the shelf or catalogue solutions. Investment in research and development of these devices for specific processes remains a black box to your competitors. They can't procure similar process elements without going on their own R&D journey. We are working on applications for these devices now. If you have an interest in this technology, please do not hesitate to get in touch to find out how we can help you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.